This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. Deep South Dining is the show all about the culture of Southern flavor. From fried chicken and collard greens to shrimp and grits and a glass of sweet tea. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or download our MPB Public Media app. Okie dokie folks, welcome back. Horticulture's fell to rushing. And uh, if I look a little groggy this morning, Java, I've been up since about four. Wait a minute. Yeah, uh, I mean... Yeah, <laughs> I think I, everybody's I, probably maybe been up since about well, four. Well, <laughs> you know, I, I need my beauty sleep, don't get me wrong, but uh, I got an alert on my phone. I mean, it was not letting me sleep. And I, I looked up and I said, holy cow, this is a storm coming in. And, you know, we have storms. Everybody has storms. I'm not complaining. I'm not saying, oh, we're special. But uh, it was just scary enough where I actually got up and put my jeans on because I didn't want to be found in my knickers up in a tree somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was it was a real a real deal thing happening. That's always scary happening you, you during you, the sleep. You lost some power though. Yes, we I guess around four o'clock, four or five o'clock this morning, we lost power. Um, um, all of my kids are at my. Grand, at my parents' house, their grandparents' house, because they have power, uh-huh. but we don't have power, and uh, yeah, that's just what we're dealing with. Yeah, you know, and again, I don't want to uh, certainly don't want to discount the the real tragedies that happen. You know, like what the tornado hit Texas and all like that. But uh, you know, it was um, it just it's part of it. Anyway, it got me awake, and I got to catch up on some emails and stuff. <laughs> so it ain't no telling if I emailed anybody at four or five this morning. Uh, I apologize for my spelling. It's because of the weather. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And we're going to be talking about gardening for the next hour or so. And Java, it is cranking up, man. Summertime is cr- it hot and humid. You know, just standing around with a hose in your hand, you have sweat dripping. And the bu- leaf-footed bugs and the uh, the insects and everything is just it's busting loose, man. It's busting loose. Yeah, you got to make sure that you um, wear your long hats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Matter of fact, a guy posted a picture, uh, a humorous picture on the Mississippi Gardening Facebook uh, with some some wildflowers between his toes. You know, it's just uh, you know I've been there walking barefoot. You know, everybody said, but but people uh, I, I noticed and other people said, you know, you need to have that spot on the top of your foot l- looked at. <laughs> <laughs> because it's just uh, it's hat wearing time of year and uh, humidity and all. But anyway, a lot of people have got stuff going on with the, with the the rains that we've had the past week. A lot of people uh, who grow corn is falling over. It's called lodging corn and sunflowers. They flop over. Uh, I had some uh, tall flowers, some old fashioned coxcomb flowers uh, blow over. You just stand them back up and keep going. That's all it is. And speaking of rain, the last Saturday you were at the pickle fest, which um, kind of got got some got some rain. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was at the uh, the herb garden behind the ag mule. Which, by the way, anybody, if y'all are coming to Jackson, want to have a, a nice little stroll around an old town, small town, an old farm, an incredible museum, the uh, the agriculture museum on Lakeland Drive. It is really, really nice. It's family friendly, uh, but it's it's interesting. But uh, be sure to in the little small town area to look behind the doctor's place at the little cottage garden we call the doctor's garden. It's got uh, culinary herbs. It's got all sorts of medicinal herbs that used to be used a hundred years or so ago and a lot of antique flowers like you like grandmama used to grow and uh, anyway I was sitting in my truck because it was raining so much the truck was rocking back and forth and I was under an old china beer tree but I was watching vendor tents get flattened it was it was it was it was rough but um anyway that's just part of life life in the south you know and these kind of rainfalls harsh as they are it's what keeps us from being west Texas so it's what makes trees grow lay some trees on the ground but anyway we're going to be talking about gardening folks I guess a cheesy tune coming up uh, we've got the uh, an answer to a question that nobody really ever asked coming up but uh, it's all about what's going on in your garden so we're going to start out right off the bat in jackson talk with jim good morning jim how are you good morning felder jim rosenblatt here howdy i've got a question i've got a question about herbicides okay i'm uh i like to pull up weeds but i also like the ease of putting out a herbicide i've heard you speak about roundup before are there any other 
types of herbicides that you would recommend? Well, th- there's a, there's all sorts of herb. You know, herbicide anything that'll kill a plant is called a herbicide. You know, when, and technically, when you're pulling weeds up, you're committing herbicide. You know, don't want to tell an old lawyer. Don't don't want to explain legal terms to an old lawyer. But you're you're a herbicidal maniac when you get out in your garden. <clears throat> but uh, you know, there, there, there's a lot of things that are safe and effective. There's a lot of home remedies that'll burn plants down. You know, a lot of people just find squirting vinegar on some plants uh, will burn them down. It won't kill perennials, but it'll at least you know it'll clean up stuff in the crack of your sidewalk. Um, so there's a lot of home remedies, but when it comes to using a, a, a chemical herbicide, uh, there's a lot of different ver- varieties out there, a lot of different products. Some will kill some plants and not others. Uh, for example, there's one that will only kill grasses. You can spray it over everything out there. The only thing that'll die, Bermuda grass, crab grass, corn, St. Augustine. Um, and then there's some that that, are, that that will burn stuff down, and it also has a residual effect that'll keep more weeds from coming. But they're a little bit trickier, so it's not any one one size fits all. You know, when I recommend uh, Roundup, Jim, it's not because I'm proud of it, and I'm not I'm not uh, sanctioning the the over abuse and uh, the big agriculture stuff. But squirting on some poison ivy, it'll kill it roots and all without you know, and it won't come back. So anyway, there's just a lot of different products, just like medicines. No, no one thing fits all. Uh, how long uh, do you have to uh, – will, will rain damage uh, the effectiveness of herbicides? Well, it depends. You know, like I say, there's some, some you put out there, and, uh, and they, they will last for, for weeks or even months, and rain won't affect them, you know, their, their, their residual effect. But some, you know, like whether it's vinegar around it, once they dry, rain doesn't affect it. It doesn't wash off or anything like that, so – Anyway, uh, again, there's too many different kind of products to have a, just a, a, a real neat thing. Both, both, uh, both, synthet- both chemical and natural have pros and cons. And so I, I wish I could come up with a, a real easy answer, but there's not. What I do uh, is I pull it by hand. You know, I will squirt something on some poison ivy or privet hedge or something that's hard to kill otherwise. Uh, but, you know, I found out, well, like with nutgrass, if you pull it, it'll come back. But if you pull it... When it first comes back, before it gets a chance to get started again, and then pull it a third time, each time gets less. But the trick is you got to stay on top of it and don't let it get reestablished before you pull it that second. So I pull two or three times with nutgrass, and that usually gets rid of it without herbicides. Well, I, I think what I'll do is my punishment for using herbicides, I'll engage in some community service. <laughs> there's, no, there's nothing wrong with using herbicides any more than anything using deodorant. You know, products are products, and, <laughs> and they have the use, but don't, don't, don't overdo them and don't miss you. We run into problems with any kind of pesticides when people don't read the label, they don't choose the right product, or they misapply it, or they overuse it. And that's always going to be – that's true of beer and wine. You know, there's a time and place, and don't overdo it. Well, thank you so much, Herb. Okay. I appreciate it. All right. Good luck on it. See you, Jim. All right. Let's slide over to Clinton, talking to Danny. Danny, sounds like you got something kinky on your mind this morning. (laughs) Uh, Yes. When I was a kid, we always had a big garden, and we loved okra. And sometimes okra would not produce. Yeah, shut shut us down. So Dad said, uh, go get you a switchboard and whoop the okra. <laughs> yeah, I've heard it all my life. I've I done it. Switch and I whipped it and it started making okra. Yeah. Well, I've got, I've got three zucchini plants, and my grandbaby loves zucchini. Mm-hmm. I am getting about one or so a day, and, and one plant was not producing. I said, well, I'll try that. So I whipped the leaves. <laughs> yeah. Well... It started producing. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's actually there, there's actually a, a a a reason for that and an explanation why it works. Uh, and and this is the same thing that causes you know when we have a big hurricane down on the coast and a couple of months later all the azaleas and spring blooming plants are are, are blooming again. Um, and what happens, plants produce a hormone. It's called traumatin. Traumatin, sort of like our version of of. Uh, of uh, adrenaline, you know, you get scared 
you get a shot of adrenaline, it makes you get up and go. Plants have this stuff called traumatin, and if they're if they're injured or they're whipped around or they're bent or they're you know just any kind of real hard stress, it releases traumatin, which kicks a plant into reproductive mode to try to save itself. And so when you switch okra, or you can just take the 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 uh, the, the long stem and just bend it over, not. Till it breaks, but bend it over really, really far, and then it snap back into place. It releases traumatin and it kicks in flowering. Ain't that a weird thing? Well, I enjoyed the whipping of it. it, it <laughs> I knew we, I knew we were going to go there, Danny. You, you know, you, you're not just there for the for the zucchini, are you? <laughs> well, my grandbaby loves it, and I grow it. Well, you're and you're raising so, you're ra- raising your grandbaby right. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> appreciate your call, Danny. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Bye bye. Let's see, Java. That would have been a good thing. Qu- answers the question I want to ask. You know, what does switching your okra do? Yeah, that's a that's a big part of it. It it, it works with uh, sometimes a tree won't bloom. You know, or vine won't bloom, and you can take a shovel and go out from the trunk a few feet and make a few cuts here and there, and it it chops just enough root, not enough roots to hurt it, but enough to to shock it into producing traumatin, and it kicks it into bloom. Root pruning can can cause uh, plants to bloom. Anyway, it, it, there is some truth to switching your okra, and not and not just for fun. <laughs> yeah, not not just for yourself. Uh, <laughs> I mean, if you got that kind of uh, feeling in you, go pull some weeds, okay? Just pull some weeds. Okay, and let's go up to, to oh, slide over to the hills to Water Valley. Hugh, how are you this morning? Uh, I'm fine, thank you. You having a good day? So far, so good. I had to, to, to drive around some fallen trees in my neighborhood, but, you know. Oh, gosh. That's just, yeah. just, that's just w- 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 trees got to well, grow, trees got to hit the ground. What you, what you got going well, on today? I've got trees hitting the ground, and I've got traumatized trumpet honeysuckle. <laughs> okay, do I? <laughs> yeah. Is this a trumpet honeysuckle? Is this a, the, the native one with the little this reddish is, flowers? The native one, I have both the red and the yellow. It is such a, it's such a, a great, over, it's overlooked in gardens because it doesn't look like much in a pot, so people don't buy it. But what a fantastic plant. I, I have two huge yellow ones and one huge red one. And what I've been I've been doing for the last couple of years, I keep them I keep them deadheaded, like what you were talking about with the okra. Uh-huh. I keep them cut back so that they will bloom all year. Is that going to affect the plant adversely in any way? Not, not really. You know, pruning, uh, this is another thing. Um, uh, again, traumatin, if you prune a plant, you know, it'll just sit there. It sits there, sits there, it puts out new growth at the ends. But it, it, if you cut it, all of a sudden it sprouts back out. And this reduces, it's a different hormone that's produced by the ends of the branches, ends of the twigs. And when you cut the ends off, that hormone is not, that suppressing hormone is not there. So plants sprout back out again. So it actually thickens them up and makes them quite nice. I wouldn't do any of this past about the the middle of August, though, because the the, the Plants need to have time to put out new growth, and it's got to have time to settle down and mature in the shorter days of fall before winter. And that way, it, it grows a lot. So I wouldn't do any any real hard pruning past about the middle of the end of August. Well, you know, I, when I say prune, I just go back to that what that second set of leaves to where you have the leaves that aren't joined together. Right, right. I like to cut and cut back there. So it goes out. Okay, the other thing I have is I have had a large dead tree cut in my yard and dropped in the yard. Mm -hmm. And I have some huge pieces of trunk that are rotten in the middle. And I just enjoy setting a fire on one end (laughs) and and watch them burn for about a week. You know, there's something in the air this morning. But you guys are just, y'all are just, you know, you're just doing weird stuff out in the yard. But at the same time. I'm a guy. I understand. I tell you what's really, really weird, and maybe I shouldn't say this, you, but next time you set a fire and a holler log, get your leaf blower and put it on the other end and watch what happens. Oh yeah. But I do it. It does. That. And there's kids around. You know, explain to them. Don't do this without grown-ups around. <laughs> but man, oh man, do this right at dusk, and it is a show. 
Okay. <laughs> this is the guy I think. Okay, I, I, I need to have a disclaimer here of some kind, Java. But we're talking about guys doing weird stuff because we're guys. And that goes it, along with being a guy. <laughs> <laughs> and adult beverages. Yeah, that's right. Be careful. Okay, now what, what I have now is these strips about 10 feet long and 3 feet wide of burned dirt. Yeah. And what do I, you know, I'm thinking zinnias, but do I need to do anything to that soil because it's been, you know, suffered through a fire? Not not really. You know, the worms and things like that, you know, they'll come back. Uh, you know, if you could if you could dig it up a little, you know, break, you know, dig down a little bit and bring some of the unburned dirt up and mix it with it, you know, that'll re-inoculate the, the soil with the, the, the good things, the ba- beneficial bacteria and fungi and worms and all like that. Uh, the only short-time problem is wood ash is extremely alkaline, and, uh, yeah. and it can temporarily make it so alkaline that plants don't grow but if you can dig it up or till it up or something like that won't be any real problem at all after three or four good rains uh those wood ashes dissolve and they wash away okay okay i was just wondering if i need to do any cotton seed meal or well yeah food. yeah normal stuff you know normal yeah. stuff but but it's for but I, I would dig it up now i gotta ask you this before we go is somebody holler at you about this I think she's... Okay, no, no, said. <laughs> enough said. Enough said. <laughs> Plant you some zinnias, boy. Get out there and put you some zinnias so he's All out right. there quick. <laughs> Thank you. Have a great day. Okay. Java, there's something in the air you, this morning. You you had it on. You 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 were you were ready, Felder. You knew exactly what was going on. <laughs> well, you know, we've all been hollered at. You that know, was that was funny. I told somebody the other day that the only thing that holds me back is my mother, my dear old mother, who's been dead all these years. I swear, she's standing behind me right now, and she's gonna smack me on the back of the head if I don't straighten up. <laughs> she <laughs> she put it on you. Okay, who we go to next? John down in Mobile, Alabama. Hey, John, how are you this morning? Not yet. John oh. is actually being queued up. Let's okay. go to Tupelo. Tupelo. Madeline in Tupelo. Good morning, Madeline. Hello. Good morning. Howdy. Hi. What's up? Hi. Um, so I've got a couple blueberry bushes on the side of my house, and they're about three years old. Uh-huh. And- I know they've got to be established for a little while. Well, the past several years, I've just planted random vegetables around them to encourage pollinators around. Mm-hmm. But this year, I know I'm not going to be able to put the normal vegetable bin in around them, but I didn't know if there was a flower that you would recommend or some other plant that, like a perennial, would be great just to be around to help encourage um, more butterflies and bees. Yeah, this 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 is all sorts of things. You know, this is something decades ago. Uh, me and a, a gal named named Eve Dingus, we put up a twenty thousand square foot butterfly greenhouse at the Jackson Zoo, where people you know went through and all like that. And we put maybe uh, thirty different kinds of butterfly plants in there. But if we wanted to take pictures of butterflies on plants, we always went to lantana and zinnias. You know, they, you know they're easy to grow. They are good for all sorts of pollinators, but, you know, those are the easiest ones. And there's a good uh, double handful of dependable plants that bloom a long time. But I would start with uh, lantana, which will uh, some zinnias, you know, even some small zinnias. Uh, Any of the perennial blue salvias, you know, they they come back every year. They're terrific, not just for for, for butterflies and bees, but for hummingbirds. Matter of fact, a hummingbird sticks his head up in that open blue flower of perennial blue salvia, and it puts a little dab of pollen on their forehead, and they take it to the next flower. <laughs> I wish I was making this stuff up. But uh, but the perennial blue salvias come back year after year, and they bloom all the time. And they, and they come with they're different, different varieties, but in general, they all are real dependable perennials, good pollinators all year. Good deal. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Well, I want I want to throw something out though. You you know you said uh, you putting the you're not putting these out for the blueberries. You putting it out because you want to get more out of the space. Because blueberries don't need help with pollinators. You know they 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 have their own flowers and actually their own set of bees that that do the pollinating. Well, and again, I don't know too much about them. I've just I've planted them and willing to be patient to see what happens in a couple of years. And they've been like each year they get a little bit bigger, but you yeah. know just. Here, here, it's been growing. Here, here's. I've always been told that you have to have two different bushes 
Well, pollinators come around them. No, no, the pollinators, pollinators are out there anyway. Pollinator, native, po, po, little native bees and the flies and and even the honeybees, they're already out there. That's that's not a problem. And they tend to bloom early. So p- putting pollinators out in the summer, these plants bloom in the in the late winter and spring. So you know that's that's the only time you need the bees. But here's and I grow blue. I've been growing blueberries forever. I don't have room for a lot in my yard, so I dug one big hole and I put five different kinds of blueberries in the same hole. And they're growing together as one big old pretty bush, uh, and you get better oh, product. Wow. Yeah, you get better fruiting if you have two or more different kinds, varieties of blueberries. But one blueberry can make can make berries. Okay, so, well, good. That- that was very helpful. Here, here, I might just get me some more blueberry bushes instead. Of well, here, here's here's the deal, and and just just a real quick little checklist. When I plant blueberries, when I recommend other people, it, it's a terrific landscape plant. Mine are loaded with berries right now because I covered them up in that late freeze. But uh, three things: when you when you plant them. Add some real peat moss to your soil, you know, real Canadian peat moss or good quality potting soil, which is peat moss. Add it to your dirt so it's mostly dirt, <clears throat> sort of like a handful of crackers crumble up in a bowl of chili. That'll give you the idea of how much. But make a nice yeah. wide hole, at least two, maybe two and a half or even three feet across. Add a little stuff to the dirt. And then when you plant the blueberry, loosen up its potting soil so it can get used to this new dirt. And then... Every time it sends out some some suckers or new growth in the spring or early summer, snip the tips of that off. And instead of them shooting up long and tall, each one of those will branch out. You'll have a more compact plant, more twigs, more flowers, more berries. So anytime up until about the first or middle of July, if you'll just snip the tips off of this year's growth, the stuff that came out this year, then it'll stop it growing mm-hmm. long. It'll make it branch out and have more berries. Perfect. And if I wanted to plant some more bushes, is there a better time of year to do that? Nope. I mean, is summer okay as long as I keep it watered? The, the, yeah, yeah, a, a good soaking once a week, plenty. Don't keep them too wet, uh, but a good soaking once a week. But the answer, any plants in a pot can be planted any time you can dig a good hole. And this is not a great year, g- g- great time to get out. But with all this rain, if you can go ahead and dig a pretty good hole now, add some stuff to it, cover it with bark mulch or plant some flowers or peppers or you know so in other words get the hole done while you can and then when you get the blueberries the hole's already dug but you can do that any time of the year good deal well thank you for all your help i appreciate it all right appreciate your call now what java uh we've been rocking and rolling this morning um let's take mike from hernando okay all righty mike how are you this morning good morning sir uh, morning, Felder. Do you know a man up here in Olive Branch named Lynn Lahoon? Um, if you don't, let me tell you why you need to, and I want to get his information to you. He is a gardener, owns Icing Farm, A-I-S-L-I-N-G Farm in Olive Branch. Mm-hmm. They're doing growing things, doing experimental plant growth, some crossbreeding, and he's growing some plants that are not native here. And the layout is fantastic. You never saw anything like it. Hmm. He's got, you know, enormous acreage. And uh, he's a gardener, and he's working with the local colleges and their students and doing some incredible things up here. I looked over there and said, what in the heck is that? He said, well, that's a crossbreed. And they're growing like crazy, gorgeous flowers. Crossbreed of what? uh, Wait, wait, crossbreed? I didn't know. (coughs) Crossbreed of what? Different kinds of zinnias, different kind of rows of what? Well, he's cross-reading everything. He's growing experimental flat flowers and uh, fields of them, and he's working with the local colleges. I would like to get his information to you because I'd like you to know him. Uh, he's a he's an incredible gardener. This would be uh, this the farm be ter- is quite large. This would be terrific. You just you need to email it to me though. Email me. And, I'm going to. Uh, yes, do, I want if, to. If you go to felderrushing dot blog b l o g felderrushing dot blog, it's got a uh-huh. button that says email me, and uh, and and I, I I mean I'm because see I work with experimental too. That's what extension. So that's what the research stations do, and they're always looking for what we call citizen scientists. Citizen scientists, uh, you know, coming up with stuff that the researchers uh, may not have a grant to do or they got other stuff going on, whatever. But this is a really important way where where we learn about stuff. And my job is to put that information out there. So let's 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 put me together with this guy. 
I mentioned your name to him, and he says, oh, yeah, I know him. He listens to you. He says, yeah, I know Felder. I said, have you met him? He said, no. I said, good Lord, Lynn, you've got to meet <laughs> okay, him. Okay, li- listen, I, I'm like a bad gas wafting around, okay? <laughs> I've been doing this a long time. Li- li- put, hook, put us together. We'll take it from there. I will. Thanks, Felder. All righty, Mike. Appreciate it. Okay, Java, I got a really, really cheesy tune. You want to do that now or what? We got a well, whole bunch of folks calling, but you we know? do have a whole bunch of folks calling, and I really want to talk to um, Robbie, who let, is really in. Let, let's let's Peru. do let's let's do that first because he's hanging he's hanging on a long distance, right? Yes. Okay, Robbie's calling from Peru. What part of Peru, uh, by the way? Because I you know I've been to the tip of it. Cusco, Peru. Okay, it's near the Urubamba River, by any chance? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just uh, 45 minutes, something cool. like that. Cool, cool, cool. I've got two things about okra. I grew it in Memphis for uh, 15 or 20 years in my backyard. And I may be wrong, but I discovered that when you take just the okra and the plant continues to grow, the leaf that supported the okra that you cut eventually dies. Yeah. So I always took that leaf off because I figured there was no point in trying to support a leaf that was eventually going to die. We just let the plant stay healthy and continue to grow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, and the other thing, you can, eat, you, you can eat okra right off of the plant. Oh, yeah. I, 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 I ate a raw okra pod yesterday uh, at the Ag Museum. Uh-huh. I, grew, I grew a variety called uh-huh. Burgundy, a little furry thing, you know. Uh-huh. I, yeah. Because you said that you don't like it, I think, for the slime. Yeah, but, but that's when you, you don't get the slime. That's right, and uh, I mean, you can eat. The, there's a fellow who wrote a book called, called uh, about okra, and uh, oddly enough, he's from Preston, Lancashire. Uh, born and raised, his family still has a nursery less than ten miles of where I stay in northern England, and uh, he's in North Carolina. He wrote a whole book on okra. All the different varieties, so many different ways you can use it and eat it, and even the leaves you can eat. Really? Yeah. Huh. Never heard that. Okay. Well, All right. I just wanted to pass that along. That's a that's a great tip. And uh, and and by the way, one other thing is when they get real long and tall. I, I grow a real compact variety called Burgundy. It only gets about chest high, maybe a little bit taller. It produces a lot of uh, fruit or a more compact plant. But you can also prune them or cut every other one and make them branch out. So you can have an okra bush instead of a okra fishing pole. Yeah, when mine would get too tall where I couldn't reach him, I'd cut him about waist or knee high and let him come back. Yeah. Well, Liz, we got a, we, we, we got a scoop, but I want to find out how far south of the equator. The equator runs through, through, uh, through Ecuador, through Quito. How far south right. are you from the equator? Ooh, I guess maybe six or eight hundred miles. Okay, way on down there. Way on down there. Yeah, yeah. We're going into winter right now, and it's oh, yeah. going to be a bad one, I think. Oh, yeah. We've already yeah. had snow. Yeah. Well, that's what you get moving the Andes instead of the Smokies. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, man. We got to scoot. Thanks, uh, Robbie. Appreciate it a whole bunch. Bye. And now it's time for answers to questions nobody ever asks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we were talking about hormones and all this, and I don't know what, what's getting into people like, right now, but it's kind of crazy. But there's an interesting thing happening right now, Java. Uh-huh. People are, are picking corn because we've had all this rain, and they peel it, and there's little corn plants starting to grow in, in the husks. Oh, what? And they'll get a tomato sometime, and they cut it open. It looks like it's got little white worms in it, but the seeds are sprouting inside the tomatoes. It's a weird thing. So please explain. The, the, thank you. It, uh, it, it, in a nutshell. Uh, and this happens in, in citrus plants. If you've ever cut open a pepper and it's got a little pepper growing inside of it, you know, this is fairly common. And it's called, in America, we say vi, 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 viva, viva peri. In England, it's vivipary, but <laughs> V-I-V-I, peri. Uh, what happens, there's a hormone that keeps seeds from sprouting until time, you know, so they don't sprout too early. And sometimes uh, it wears out, or if you leave a tomato uh, on the stem too long, or we have a lot of rain when the corn seeds are ripe and it gets wet inside the husk, these, uh, this, this, this hormone, uh, and I can tell you the name of it, it's not important, but the hormone is gone and they sprout early. Sometimes you'll get a strawberry and the seeds are, stra- the little bumpy things on the outside of strawberry, those are the seeds. They're on the outside of the strawberry and they'll sprout. You have a little, little strawberry with little plants growing all around. 
around it. Anyway, in case anybody want to know, it's because there's a hormone that suppresses this, and under certain conditions, the hormone disappears or certain weather conditions, and you get little seeds sprouting inside or around the outside of the fruit. Vivipary or vivipary. Now, we're going to have to choose one now. Well, you know, here in, here in Mississippi, we can say Vivi Perry. It's, it's Viva Perry, you know. So you get a corn inside of a corn or a pepper in a pepper. It's like a two for one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, and there, there's a lot of other stuff. But right now, people are, you know, a lot of people are finding a tomato. They cut it home. It looks like little white worms throughout it. It's just a seed sprout. It's a little, little root of the seed sprouting. Yeah. And uh, But with all this rain, I thought I'd bring it up because uh, the people are having the corn in. Uh, it's producing. It's ready, ready to pick. It can't get out in the field because it's too wet. Well, the water that gets down inside the husk, it can make those seeds sprout early. So if you see that, it's okay to eat them. It looks weird, and it's okay to eat them. But you can also take those off and plant them. And There's have a, little fun a service with that, that sells misshapen uh, vegetables and fruits and things. Because a lot of people, you yeah. know, they look for the super pretty and but it's still you can still eat these things. Yep, yep, yep. Well, anyway, vi- vi- vivipary or vivipary is uh, what's causing those seeds to sprout in there. Not that anybody ever asked me this, Java, but there it is. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> let's let's get back to the phones. I don't even know who's next. Is it John from Mobile? Yeah, let's talk with John from Mobile. John, thank you for holding, man. What's going on? Oh, good morning. Uh, I've got an eggplant question. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've never planted it till this year. As a matter of fact, we don't even like it. But, uh, <laughs> a friend gave gave us some plants, and we put them in the ground and got some eggplants growing. And thinking to myself, okay, when do I know that they're ready to pick? So I read a little bit and said when they're shiny and glossy, they're ready to pick. Mm-hmm. So we picked a couple, gave it to some friends, and he said we should have let them get bigger. So... How long after they get glossy will they stay glossy before they don't get glossy and they become hard? You know, this is a this is a good question, and every single time you pick one, the same question is going to come up because there's is not a straight answer to it. You can eat them when they're really, really little. Some varieties get big. I mean, they get so big you can you can can't even get your hand halfway around it. But um, yeah, you know, if you let them where they they stay where they get glossy, they get really mealy taste. So the 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 answer is anytime you get around to it, if it starts looking kind of dull, it's too long. But there's there's no uh, in different variety. There's some that are that look just they're shaped like and look like goose eggs. They're white and they're shaped just like an egg. Some are long and skinny like a zucchini or uh, you know. And, and so there's all different varieties. But the the straight old traditional one, they can get big enough where you know you can barely put your hand halfway around it, still shiny. So there, there's not a straight answer. So in any time up till it starts to lose its shine. I would say these are typical you'd see in, in the grocery store. And yeah. It, it, they were about four to five inches long. And, you know, okay, it says when they're shining, you can see your face in it. Yeah. They're ready to pick. So yeah. I picked them. And yeah. I've seen the Japanese uh, eggplants that are long and skinny like zucchini. And the, the the ones that are shaped like little little white little little white big white eggs, you know, I mean, just about the size of a goose egg. But anyway, different varieties. And when you get stuff from the store, uh, you know, the seeds or the plants, it may be a, a, new, a modern hybrid, and they're bred to be ripe when they're smaller, easier to ship, and all like that. So he might be thinking about one that that that, that Aunt Mamie used to grow that got really really big. So so it just depends on the variety. Yeah, maybe. So I, anyway, I have no idea what what this guy gave us, but they they grew and they produced. So I, I was, I said, okay, we can do it. Okay, well, find some uh, way. Thank you very yeah, much. Okay, hey, here's the thing. You know the the guy who's say, saying they weren't big enough, right? Let's find some way. Email yeah. me. Let's find some way to punk him. Let's let's find some find some way to mess with him. And you and I know about it, and he doesn't. <laughs> okay. Okay. Appreciate it, man. Thanks for calling, John. All righty, now to Neshoba Neshoba County. County. Talk to Bill. Bill, you staying you staying cool and hydrated today? Uh, yes, I am. I got all hot and sweaty yesterday, right after the rain stopped. I did too. You know, the rain. Uh, people not from the south don't understand when it rains. We like rain, but as soon as the sun comes out, it turns to steam. Yep, absolutely. Yep. So what, what, what's you you losing trees last night? Well, uh, I uh, lost some limbs, uh-huh. and that was that was why I was out yesterday. I had a, a low limb uh, that uh, broke off, so I 
cut it off and made it an angle and all that good stuff. And I, this morning I thought, well, maybe I should look up in the tree and see if there's anything else. And it turns out that the main trunk uh, is also split. Yeah. And I'm, I'm wondering, can, I, can this tree be saved? Or? Well, the, it, 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 I don't know that it needs saving because it's going to do what it's going to do, but there's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing I can do about it. And, and I help teach the tree surgery course. You know, there's, a, there's this thing called uh, bracing where you can drill all the way through a trunk from one side to the other and put a long rod in there with some, some uh, washers on the end to sort of pull it together and, and tie it into place. Uh, you know, you can do that with cables. You know, there's all sorts of tree surgery tricks like that. But the bottom line is once it splits open, if it's been open for a day or two, it's got dust and all sorts of stuff that's got wood decay fungus in it. And sooner or later, it's going to hollow out. There's just nothing we can do about that. So, uh, you know, uh, is this uh, unless a tree is close to a structure, one of my neighbor's big limbs is hanging right over my driveway that wasn't hanging over it yesterday. I noticed this is one of the leaves brushed my Jeep when I backed out of the driveway, and it's a big limb, and it's at least five or six feet lower than it was yesterday. It's going to fall. Um, we could brace that. You know, we could cable it or something like that, but sooner or later, it's just going to have to be cut off. And, uh, and there, there's oh, no— go ahead. So what? If I go ahead and cut it off, uh, I mean that's in, it's in the middle of the tree. It's, yeah, uh, yeah. You know this, down. and th- and this this happens out in the woods. This is where owls and flying squirrels and stuff like that live. You know this is actually fairly normal. The inside of a tree uh, is, you know, when, when you look at the rings of a of a of a branch being cut, that's all dead wood. The only living part of a tree, that part of the tree, is right under the bark. That the current year's growth that will be a ring later. But once you get the inside exposed and gets dust or dirt or anything like that, it's going to start to decay, and there's not a thing we can do about that except just just go with it. So if it's a danger to something, if it were to split off, uh, I'd, I'd, t- I'd, I'd trim it. But otherwise, you know, just, just you know, go with this flow. This is real, real natural, and lots and lots of creatures live in the, that part of those trees. Lots and lots of cre- uh, creatures. But no, nothing you can do about it other than uh, live with. Here, here's here's, here's my, my order of importance, my four, my philosophy on approach to thing. If you can't fix it, flee it, or fight it, flow with it. <laughs> so, but no, okay. there, there, there's no treatment for it, so I'll just keep an eye on it and think about uh, possible damage when it falls. And it may be 50 years from now. It might be next week. We just don't know. Any, anybody who tells you more than what I just said, making it up. Okay. <laughs> All righty. Uh, well, I, I think I... Uh did, uh, uh, you, I'm still undecided. You know, if we were standing there talking face to face, talking, we would both throw it. We we push our shoulders up, we put our hands up, and say, well, "I don't know." <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's the truth of it. I don't know, but uh, it could live for a long time. Uh, but there's there's nothing there's nothing anybody can do about it. So just cut off what's going to be a, a a danger or it really bothers you, and that's all we can do. Okay. All right, I'll give that a try. Yeah. Oh, let me throw out one other thing for for you and any other folks who are listening who have a lot of damage. We don't have to haul limbs and stuff off. You can push them off to one side and stack them up and, you know, put them in a row or something and then throw branches and twigs on top of that and then throw leaves on top of that. It's, it's called hugel culture. Uh, just pile limbs up, put branches on top of that, put leaves on, and then next year plant you some ferns around it. You know, this has been done forever. You don't have to haul them all off. You can use them to create a nice little habitat for lightning bugs and pollinator bees and lizards and stuff like that and plant azaleas around in a couple of years. So I got a couple of places like that in the garden. Uh, the, the, the late it's great land, the, the fellow who was a professor emeritus at Louisiana State University, landscape, School of Landscape Architecture, Neil Odenwald, who was from the Delta originally, uh, he cut his, he had a big yard in Baton Rouge, and uh, I was uh, doing some studying with him one time. I used to stay with him, and he would l- l- connect trees. He'd have three or four trees, and he would lay these things down in between them, sort of like uh, connecting the dots. 
and 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 turn them into a like a bed, and then he cut his mowing by fifty percent. It said it used to take him two hours to mow his grass. He got it down to fifty minutes to mow his entire lawn by just connecting the trees with debris and stuff, and then planting azaleas and ferns around it. Uh-huh. If I tell that story to my wife, do you think she'll buy it? You know. Okay, we're sta- we're looking at each other. We got our shoulders up. We got hands up, saying, "I don't know." <laughs> Good luck on it. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it, Bill. Java, what's going on today? I don't know. <laughs> um, we need a little bit more feminine energy in the. Uh, yeah, this is not a misogynistic <laughs> thing. This is survival. This is self preservation here. But you know, I was yes. I would say, well, then you drag it to the street, sweetheart. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't. You know that. Okay, who we got next? We got. Let's go, like I just said, we need some more feminine energy. Um, Let's talk to Diane in Brookhaven. Help us out, Diane. How are you this morning? Calling from Brookhaven. Hey, Felder. Hey, so I've got these beautiful pagoda flowers, clerodendron. Clerodendron. Thank you, clerodendron. But anyway, so I've got these beautiful pagoda flowers, and um, and I'd like, we're about to move, Uh and I'd like to take with me is there a way that i can do that i know that they they, they make um, suckers or, yeah yeah they, they little plants come up all around it you know if you cut some of those back to like let's say i don't know how tall they are but you know a foot foot and a half two feet or so tall and dig up that little root and put it in a pot it will it will not only survive but it'll branch out see so if you're going to dig some go ahead and cut them back first this uh it'll help it survive and it'll make it a healthier plant Okay, so I just cut it back, and then I can dig it up and put it in a pot, and then it'll yeah. be good for next year. Yeah, and uh, let me ask you this, though, uh, because when you say pagoda, um, there's a lot of folk names for plants. Is this the one that makes a small tree that's got the, the white flowers, got the little pretty uh, uh, red calyx, and then makes a, a nice little blueberry type thing? Is it a small, real fragrant small tree, or is it the, the running kind? <clears throat> This is the red kind that looks like uh, giant elephant ears, and then it, and it, then it shoots up a stalk with a okay, with a okay, flower, flower like pagoda. Okay, like you're pagoda. you're actually talking about, but that clerodendron. I was thinking, okay, that's what I was getting at. Uh, that's the one. You must is this in Brookhaven or is it down close to the coast? This is in Brookhaven. Wow, I didn't know they grow this far north. Yeah, it's a, it's a spreading perennial. Uh, go ahead and cut it back and move those. That it's a, I was thinking the, the a lot of times people call the, there's a there's a tree clerodendron that some people call um, I can't even think of the name. Anyway, it it's more common this far north. The one you're you're talking about really does better on the coast and in the Florida. So, uh, but if it made it through the winter time, I want a piece of it. Well, do you think that it'll survive in Jackson? Uh, Brookhaven, you know, is only forty-five minute drive south of Jackson. As long as you put it in kind of protected place, I, I would think so. Uh, but this one I associate with Florida and the Ghost, uh, Gulf Coast. Incredible, uh, big cluster of, of red flowers at the top. But yeah, cut it back and move those. They die back every year, and then yep. they just come on back. Yep, so. yep. Yeah, there's a clarodendron tree that grows here in, in Jackson area um, that had one at Minel Gardens for a long time, and uh, and it, it does well too. But yeah, let's give it a try. And if you got an extra well, one, you, you know, if you, if you got an extra one, I live in Jackson. I'm just saying. All right. Well, I'll <laughs> drop it off the ground. <laughs> Thanks, Felder. Appreciate okay. It. Appreciate it. Thank All you. Right. Okay, <clears throat> we got blue and and uh, sort of a teal color and orange. Do I go with the orange one? <laughs> um, I don't know what color. Is that you're Jesse looking in at? Oxford? Jesse in uh, Oxford is up next. I, I'm, I'm seeing a pattern here. I'm catching on here. Jesse, how are you today? All right. I had a question for you. Uh, my mother-in-law is going to get a lot rid of some of those uh, bushes there in every subdivision. Cheap little bushes that goes below the windows yep and she wants to get rid of them and uh this weekend i was supposed to go with a pickaxe and dig all of them up he told me i have them and all that and i was going to try to plant them next to my driveway is there anything i need to do after i dig them up to help um i guess help them regrow or after i cut all the roots and everything because i don't know how deep they are they've been there since they moved there and she said she hates them and she wants them gone. So she said I can have them. Yeah. How, how long? How about how long is, have they been there? How, about how long is the house? 
the house was built in the 80s, 90s. Yeah. Uh, okay. Here, here's, here's the deal. First of all, it's a heck of a job. You're going to kill yourself on a hot, humid weekend like this doing this stuff. Uh, but it's possible because the ground is moist. Do two things before, uh, b- before you, you, you dig them. Cut them back. I mean, cut them back to where there's not a leaf left on them. I'm real sure of what I'm saying. I've done this countless times, just countless times. If you don't cut it back, first of all, it's going to be harder to dig. And it's going to make you hot. It's going to make you mad. You're going to resent your mother and all that kind of stuff. But if you'll cut them back, uh, they're easier to dig, easier to move. But also, it takes all the stress off the top of the plant because you're going to be cutting most of the roots, leaving most of the roots behind. And those tops, this time of year, need those roots. So the way to fix that is to get rid of the top. They'll sprout back out. If they have a half a chance of surviving, cutting back doesn't hurt them at all. It makes them sprout back out. So cut them back. Dig as big a root ball as you think you can pick up, which is about the size of a basketball, a little bit bigger, by cutting straight down all the way around in a circle, and then outside the circle, cut up under it. So you can lift up a nice little neat root ball. It's like digging a piece of cake out of the middle of a cake. You know, you don't want to booger it up. You want to cut it around and lift it from the bottom. So do that, and that'll help a whole lot. You know, if you can... If you got some big pots you can put them in temporarily, that'd be great. But the main thing is try not to break the root ball. Cut them back, dig, cut straight around, then dig up under them like scooping out of some uh, a piece of cake, and uh, and try not to break the root ball. And, uh, yeah, and I was gonna put garbage bags around the about bottom of them and tie them so I could keep all the dirt and root ball with them. But and here, here's the problem. Here, here's the problem with that. And, and I, my family had a, a nursery where we planted stuff in fields and dug them and grew them. If that root ball breaks, it's going to kill the plant. See, so if you can put it in a garbage bag, try to get a, a you know, no bigger than a basketball. Because if it breaks, if it sloughs off, it may survive, but there's chances go down. So not too big a root ball. Don't hurt yourself. Don't break the root ball. And if, if there's any way you could put it in something sturdier. Any jostling around, picking it up, you know, and pick it up by the root ball. If you pick it up by the plant, that dirt's going to fall off the root, and the plant's going to have a tough time. Last thing I want to mention about this, some of those are going to make it, some aren't. You know, there's a lot of old bushes that all their roots are, you know, if you stick your arm straight out and wiggle your fingers, that's where the roots are. You're going to just be digging shoulders. See, so some of them can make it, some of them can't. It depends on what kind of bush it is. And uh, without knowing, I'm just saying, you know, don't don't hurt yourself um, because some of them ain't going to make it. It, They've been in the ground too long. I wouldn't move a plant that's 30, 40 years old. I wouldn't do it. But Mama says do it, and you got to do it. So don't hurt yourself. Is there, uh, is there anything I need to put put put, uh, uh, put in the ground when I go to replant them and all that when I get back home? Dig a pretty wide, d- dig a hole a little bit wider than you need. Set them in it. Throw the same dirt that came out of the hole back around them. Okay. Why, why, wider hole than you need, so you're throwing loose dirt back in around it, but don't add anything to the dirt. Yes, sir. Man, I do Thank not. I do. Much. I do not envy the hot, humid job you got ahead of it. But you were raised right. And say hey to mama. Jesse got a time coming up this weekend. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Speaking of time, there's a lot of festivities going. Juneteenth coming up, man. It is a federal holiday now. It's a federal holiday, and you are an amazing person because your actual <laughs> birthday is June 19th. <laughs> yeah, June 19th. I wasn't born on Juneteenth, but I was born on the same day that we celebrate that we, we celebrate Juneteenth. But It'd I was be a born different June- show if you were born on Juneteenth. <laughs> that, that, that's right. That's right. But it's a it's an interesting new holiday and uh, going to have a lot of weird weather. So I, if there are parades and people doing cookouts and stuff, but it's a federal holiday. Y'all y'all be careful and stay hydrated. Yes, yes, yes. Let's see if we can sneak one more call. Toby in Memphis. Toby, good morning. How are you, sir? I'm good. Oh, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I have a willow oak that I got more little little starters everywhere. They're all in my monkey grass. Yeah. They're, now they're hard to pull up because yep. the ground is done. How, how can I get rid of them? Okay, I have a neighbor whose oak tree throws seedling into my yard by the dozens. And uh, if you don't get them the first year, they're a booger bear to pull up. Uh, get you some kind of pry bar, a big screwdriver, uh, a, a, a shovel, anything you can use a fulcrum and cut straight down beside it and then 
push it back while you pull up. In other words, pry it out of the ground because you can't pull. It's going to hurt you trying to pull it up. But you know, maybe make a uh, you know just, just get some kind of pry bar and stick it in and then pry it out. That's the only There's way. So many of them. Uh, you, these are fresh. You're talking to somebody who does this all the time. If there was an easier way, I would do it. But a okay. pry, a pry, pry, pry bar makes it – if you don't use a pry bar, it's just going to booger up your hands. That's all it's going to do. Put some gloves on and get your pry bar. It goes quicker that way. Big screwdriver or one of those things they use to, to – uh, to, uh, flat bar is what they call them. Any, any kind of screwdriver type thing really helps to have a fulcrum. All righty. Well, we left uh, Fletch and Regina hanging. Please yeah, we call, ran out of time. Please call back next week. We've been whooping it up, maybe whooping up too much. I don't know, Java. But uh, it's going to be a, a hot, humid weekend. Got some rain, got a lot of separations. Uh, here it is coming up a week and a half before the summer solstice, but summer is here in the south. If you have a chance, take a kid to Farmer's Market or take yourself to Farmer's Market. They're ripping and roaring. There's a lot of cool people doing a lot of cool stuff, and they love to chat with you about what they're doing. So take a kid with you. If you can, show them how to do what we do best, and that's get dirty. Oh, yeah. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers. Happy Father's Day. Happy (laughs) Father's Day. And thank you. And to you, too. Yes, sir. We'll be back more of the Gestalt Garden next week. Meanwhile, go out and get dirty. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android.